All right, let's start off with a definition. So suppose that we have two vectors, and we'll call them v and w, and these vectors are in our vector space r to the n that we just talked about. Then we say that those two vectors are going to be parallel if and only if there's going to be some scalar c such that we can express w as the scalar c times the vector v. So basically what this comes down to is that our concept of being parallel basically means that you are going in the same direction or you are going in opposite directions. So now what we want to do is let's suppose that we have two vectors. Let's call them V and W. And in particular in this case we're going to assume that we are in the plane. Now what we also want to assume is that V and W are non-parallel vectors and we want to assume that neither V is the zero vector nor W is going to be the zero vector. Now what this actually lets us do for those two vectors that are kind of maybe doing something like this, V and W, if we have V with its component form V1 and V2, and if we have W with its component form W1 and W2, then for any vector U, U in the plane, we can write U as a linear combination. of V and W. Now this word linear combination is a slightly new word. We've not used that yet. But basically all it really means, it's kind of a generic term for we're going to scale V and W and then we're going to add them together. So we can find some way of scaling V and W, adding them together, and then being able to get any other vector U in the plane. Let's see how that works. So that basically what we have is our vector V, and then we've got our vector W, and then let's suppose that we've got some other vector U. And for that vector u, let's suppose that it's got components that look like u1 and u2. v has our components v1 and v2. And w is going to have our components w1 and w2. Now the idea is to find scalars. So we want scalars, let's call them x and y in the real numbers, such that we have u looking like x times v plus y times w. Now going back to our component forms, what does that really give us? x times v1, v2, plus y times w1, w2. Then when we add those together, we've got xv1 plus yw1 xv2 plus yw2 is going to be equal to our components u1 and u2. And so what we really have is a system of equations. And that system of equations gives us that u1 is going to be v1x plus w1y and u2 is going to be v2x plus w2y. So now we have this system. 
that was v1x plus w1y was going to be u1. v2x plus w2y was going to be u2. Now the idea is that we simply apply some Gauss-Jordan elimination. So the idea is that we scale the first equation by w2 and the second equation by w1. So scaling the first equation by w2, we're going to have w2 v1x plus w2 w1y is w2 u1. And then if we scale the second equation by w1, we have w1 v2x plus w1 w2y gives us w1 and u2. So now what we want to do is just subtract those two equations. When we do that, our y terms are going to cancel out. And what we're just basically left with is a v1 w2 minus a v2 w1 times x is equal to our u1 w2 minus a u2 w1, which is just going to give us a solution, x being u1 w2 minus u2 w1 over v1 w2 minus v2 w1. Now if we go ahead and do the same thing for y, what we find is that y basically just looks like v1 u2 minus v2 u1 all over v1 w2 minus v sub 2 w1. So here we have our solutions written again, our value for x and our value for y. Now there's two particular things that we want to notice about these solutions. The first one is if we take a really good close look at the denominators for both of those variables, they both exactly match, which means that we're going to have a solution if and only if v1 sub w2 minus v2 w1 is not going to be zero. Now the second thing that we need to notice uh, about these solutions is that the forms of the numerators and the denominators really look a lot the same, that we're seeing kind of a mixture of the subscripts, so a 1 and a 2, um, both for the values for x and the values for y. And so because these forms match, that's going to become an important feature that we're going to see a little later on. And so this leads us to the following observation. Suppose that we have two non-zero vectors, v and w, and these two vectors, v and w, are in R2. So let's make sure that that's going to be in there. So these vectors are in R2 then v and w are going to be non-parallel if and only if v sub 1 w sub 2 minus v sub 2 w 1 is not going to be 0. Now equivalently we could just say that v and w are going to be parallel if and only if v sub 1 w sub 2 minus v sub 2 w 1 is going to be 0. So let's start off proving this observation. So suppose that we have some v and w that are going to be parallel, and we'll assume again that these vectors are going to be non-zero. Then them being parallel means that we have some c as a real number such that c times v is going to give us w. We're writing things in component form that tells us that cv1 time and cv2 is going to be equal to w1 and w2 so that we have a system of equations. cv1 is equal to w1 and cv2 is going to be w2. Well, just checking our equation that if we do v1 w2 minus v2 w1, we plug in our values, w2 becomes cv2, w1 becomes cv1, sure enough, we factor out a c, the two values are equal, and we have a zero.
Now for the converse, let's suppose that we have v sub 1 w sub 2 minus v sub 2 w sub 1 is going to be 0. Well, since we assumed that v was not going to be the v zero vector, one of the components is not going to be zero. So without loss of generality, let's just say it's going to be the first component. Then if we come back to our equation, this is going to give us v1 w2 minus v2 w1 being zero. We move one term to the other side. Since v1 is not zero, we can divide by v1. And so that's going to give us that w2 looks like w1 over v sub 1 times v sub 2. Well, what we can then do is take our constant c to be w sub 1 over v sub 1. And that means that if we write c times v, we just plug in our values for c. In the first term, our v1s cancel out. And in the second term, by our equation that we had just above, then w sub 1 v over v sub 1 times v sub 2 is w sub 2. And so that proves our observation. So from that observation, kind of coming back where we started with all of this, was that if we had two vectors, v and w, that we could take any other vector in the plane u. Writing that thing in component form, it is always going to be possible, if v and w are not going to be parallel, to find some alpha and beta as scalars so that we can represent u as a linear combination of v and w. So we are not going to be absolutely forced to always use our e sub 1 and our e sub 2s for our i's and j's. We don't have to. We can use any other two non-parallel vectors. But what this does is to bring up another question. When we do actually use v and w, are our representations actually going to be unique? One nice thing about the e sub 1 and the e sub 2s was that those are going to be unique representations. So what if we just pick two other vectors? Will it be unique? So let's just suppose for a second that we had two different representations. So we had alpha times v plus beta times w was going to be gamma times v plus, say, lambda times w. Well, if we kind of rearrange some of these vectors, or rearrange these equations, what we end up finding is that alpha minus gamma times v ends up being the same as lambda minus beta times w. Now from here, two different things can happen. Either alpha is going to be the same as gamma, in which case the left side is going to be zero. What that means is that we then have lambda minus beta times w is going to be the zero vector. But remember, we assumed that w was not zero. So, without loss of generality, there's going to be one component, say w1, that's not zero. But if lambda times beta is, lambda minus beta times w is zero, then lambda minus beta times w1 is zero. Well, since w1 is not zero, the only thing that we can conclude then is lambda minus beta is zero, so that lambda is equal to beta. Well, that's going to be the case when we have <clears throat> alpha equal to gamma and beta equal to lambda. Well, our other case is going to be, suppose that alpha minus gamma is not going to be zero. Well, if alpha minus gamma is not going to be zero, what happens from there is that it's a scalar that we can divide by. And so what we have then is that lambda minus beta divided by alpha minus gamma times our vector w gives us our vector v. But this just says that v and w are parallel.
Since we assumed that that was not going to be the case, that V and W are not parallel, then this gives us a contradiction, and so this particular case can't happen, which means that the only case we can live in is our case here, where our representation is going to be unique. And so, in conclusion, when we're just operating in the plane, that any two non-zero, non-parallel vectors, u and v, can actually be used to represent any other vector in the plane in a unique way. And of course, this leads us to the natural question, how is this going to generalize for our n-dimensional vector space? And for that, we'll have to wait for the next video.